Hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of The Spring of Life. I am your host, Al Fadi, and today we are going to continue our discussion about discipleship, uh, that is, to be a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ. And last time, uh, we talked about the fact that every person who follows Christ is expected to be a disciple of Christ, and there are certain characteristics that they have to uh, basically exhibit. And one of it is denying the self and uh, following Jesus' teaching and applying it themselves, along with many other characteristics. But also, I mentioned last time that even a seeker is someone that we can start discipling because the discipleship process begins uh, through evangelizing. Today we are going to continue uh, along the same line of taking a closer look now at a disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ and the model that Jesus himself uh, uh, presented to individuals and through the church, the early church as well. The New Testament basically intensely is focused on Christ. It is Christ-centered. If we want to know what's it like to be a disciple of Jesus and a follower of Jesus, uh, all we have to do is just look at the New Testament, whether it's the Gospels where Jesus himself lived on earth and presented to us the perfect model to teach and be a disciple, or the model of the early church in the book of Acts, or even through the epistles and the work of the Holy Spirit and the work of Christ basically being exhibited through these letters and the church and the church members are being exhorted to grow spiritually and become a true Christ-centered disciples. So all we have to do is basically become like Jesus. This is the summary of the entire New Testament really to be a Christ-like disciple, a Christ-like follower. In fact, in Romans 8, uh, 28 to 29, the ultimate objection that God have uh, for us is to be like his son, like the image of his son, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ himself. So it's very important for us as followers of Christ to focus on this ultimate objection. The mission of the church basically is not just to teach and train. The mission of the church, the true mission of the church, is to produce Christ-centered followers, Christ-centered disciples, disciples who are in the image of Christ and the likeness of Christ in every way possible, because only then the world will know that we are his disciples, and only then the world will be drawn to him and only then the world will see the light that is his light in our life. And only then the world will glorify the Father, our Father, who is in heaven. Once again, we are going to revisit the Great Commission and see uh, once more how did Jesus basically uh, gave permission and authority to all of us to become his disciples. In uh, Matthew chapter 28, starting from verse 18, we read uh, the following. Jesus said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Notice the authority wasn't only an earthly authority. It was an earthly and a heavenly authority. This, of course, is a very deep passage. speaks about the divine authority of Jesus himself and his divine nature that he dwells both in heaven and on earth. He has power in heaven and on earth, just as it would be expected of God, who is an omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient. And therefore, the Lord is stating here, as a result of this authority that was given to him by the Father, he is now exhorting us and saying, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Notice the choice of words here. Jesus didn't say, go therefore and make converts of all nations. No, the word is disciples. In fact, the Greek word 
denotes someone who is constantly learning, a lifelong learner. And this was applied actually to people that we are evangelizing to, that we are reaching out to for Jesus, for Christ, to know the good news. So the process of discipleship, as I alluded to it earlier, and I keep repeating it, starts through the evangelism process itself. When we evangelize, we are making disciples. Why? Because you are teaching them new things that they haven't heard, or you are correcting misunderstandings about their own view and misconceptions regarding the gospel, maybe, the person of Christ, uh, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit, and so on and so forth. So any way you look at it, the process of evangelizing to somebody or someone is the process of discipling them and giving them the correct doctrines and teaching them what Jesus have taught us. Because in the Great Commission, Jesus says to go and make disciples, and then later he says to teach in them all that I have taught you. In order for, for me to basically teach someone what Jesus commanded me, what Jesus have taught me, I myself have to know this teaching. I myself have to be familiar with that teaching. I myself have to be someone who applies that teaching. In my own life, in my own ministry, I discovered that one of the best ways for me to grow and mature is to learn something from the scripture and from others as well who are students of the scripture, other mentors if you wish, and then take whatever I learned and immediately teach it to others. In fact, that's what Paul asked Timothy to do in 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting with verse 2, telling him that, you know, teach godly men, basically, the sound doctrines, so that they themselves will go also and teach other godly men. So this is the cycle. We learn and we teach and we make disciples that learn and teach others. If we continue to do this, that will be the ultimate objection of the church itself. Uh, uh, objective, I should say, of the church itself is to grow and become as a church, as one body, the Christ-centered, basically, body where Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the Father basically dwell and exist. And Jesus proceeded in the Great Commission saying that after we make disciples of all nations, we then baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you and behold. And this is very important, by the way. I am with you always until the end of the age. Notice, Jesus did not say, I'm going to abandon you. Jesus didn't say that I am going and ascending to heaven to the presence of the Father and leaving you alone. In fact, he says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. In fact, he says that if I go, I will send you another comforter, another person who is equal to me, basically. That's the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it's very important that the discipler, Jesus, or the discipler, the Redeemer, God, the Savior, continue with us. And that's exactly what Jesus does. That's what the Holy Spirit in us does. This is also something that we should learn from this. As people who are discipling others, we should never abandon them. You know, one of the things that I discovered are very damaging to a new believer, and specifically I'm going to talk about Muslim background believers, is that whenever someone contribute to sharing the gospel with them and hopefully even bringing them to Christ, instead of standing by them and helping them grow and mature in the Word of God, oftentimes they end up leaving them alone to deal with usually awful trials that they go through, the loss of maybe family, the loss of a job, the threat of persecution, maybe even go through persecution, the loss of marriage, the loss of children, the loss of a spouse, you name it. Everything and anything uh, have her, uh, that I've heard of basically happen usually to these brand new believers, especially from, an Isla from a Muslim background believers, simply because Islam is a religion that does not tolerate 
for its followers to become an apostate, if you wish. There is a death penalty that awaits him. There is the threat of imprisonment. And the community at large rejects them. The government can give itself the right to go after them legally, and so on and so forth. Unfortunately, this is the time when the new believer actually needs the nourishment of the Word of God, needs the Christ-centered model to look at and learn from. It is the time of trials and tribulations that they need someone who is a Christ follower to teach them how it's like to have a fellowship with God, to pray and ask for peace, how to persevere through these uh, times of trials and persecution. It's unfortunate that in lieu of doing this, many times individuals or churches run to celebrate that they brought someone to Christ rather than celebrate with them. They celebrate for them and they leave them alone. So this is something that I, I'm hoping that um, I'm not offending people by saying it, but I really encourage you to pay close attention to the need of your new babes in Christ. They need that nourishment. Uh, there is uh, you know, a passage by uh, uh, the Apostle Paul in 1 uh, Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. Paul was talking about the believers in Christ at the church in Thessalonica, and he gave this imagery of himself as a nursing mother feeding a child. And we think about this imagery for a second here. The only way a mother can nurse a child is by holding the child close to her chest and feeding that child. This is the imagery that Paul gave us to how it is like to raise new converts and disciple them, feed them the Word of God, nourish them, stand by them, and not abandon them. In fact, that letter was written specifically by Paul to defend his position before the church that his departure that was sudden was caused by persecution, nothing else. He did not abandon them because he made any material gains from them. He did not abandon them because he felt like he was raising support out of them. Uh, contrary to that, he in fact mentioned many times that his motive wasn't material, wasn't monetary, in fact was in fame. His intention was to make disciples for Jesus. He relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. He was obedient to the calling of Christ to him, to be a messenger of the gospel. And he called that gospel in a variety of ways. He called it the gospel of God, the gospel of Christ. And he made sure that his reputation was not tarnished simply because Paul knows very well if his reputation as a messenger and ambassador for Christ is tarnished, it is Christ who will be tarnished, not Paul himself. And we end up forgetting this sometimes. Part of the discipleship, by the way, is to teach people how to become like Jesus, humble, with integrity. They have the ability to rely on the provisions of God, trusting God alone, not trusting man, not pleasing man, but pleasing God himself. This is what Jesus taught us, and this is the model he gave to Paul and to the apostles, and this is what the model that he is given to all of us as well. The fact that authority is given to Jesus gives him the right to command all of us to go and make disciples. And of course, a disciple is someone who is a learner, a lifelong learner. In other words, you may go to school, you may earn a degree, that might take two years, four years, seven years, it depends on the level that you are seeking. And you may call yourself a graduate, but I can assure you of this, biblically speaking, there is no such thing as a graduate from the school of Christ. You are always a disciple of Christ all of your life. You will always learn and dig deeper and deeper into the meaning of the word, and you will always be serving Christ. There is no retirement in Christianity. I say this all the time, and I've heard it before from others. This is a great honor to serve the Lord. But if I wanna be an effective servant, I myself have to know what is it that I'm serving 
and how I can serve it effectively. And that's basically the reliance on the Word of God. And this will lead me basically to the first important model when it comes to discipleship. And that's the model of Jesus himself. For instance, the discipleship was basically based on Jesus' method of winning the world to himself. In fact, if, if we think about the time that Jesus spent since he declared his ministry, if, uh, basically almost three and a half years, during the three and a half years, you hear of multitudes that are following Jesus, but we don't hear of how many actually came to know him. Simply because Jesus' model was to teach and pour his heart out to these disciples, to these people that he was reaching out to. He had compassion for them. He fed them, not only just physically, but he fed them spiritually. He modeled everything possible before them so that when they follow him, they already know how to behave and how to act. So he was discipling the multitudes, even though maybe a handful of them became followers of him. We, we hear many times, actually, when we're reading the Gospels that many left him after hearing certain things that they disliked. Nevertheless, no matter what it's like, to follow Christ, Jesus' ultimate objective was to make these people disciples. And we know, of course, that later, after his death and resurrection, some became believers as a result of this. So, so God knew that the process is not going to be to waste. We are always in the process of planting seeds. This is why we're called farmers. That's why we are called by Christ fishers of men, because it's a process, it's an effort. We do the best we can, but we rely on the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit, basically. The other model that as disciples we have to follow, and the other model that I would say the church at large must follow, not only just the model of Jesus, but the model also of the early church, which followed the model of Christ himself, of course. But we have a body that called itself believers, and we must learn from them how they endured, how they behaved, how they did different things. In fact, I want to go to the book of Acts, for instance, and we want to go to the book of Acts chapter 2. And in the book of Acts chapter 2, we are going to read about how the new church, the young church, the early church in Christ behaved almost immediately after coming to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. For instance, in chapter 2 of the book of Acts, here the Apostle Peter preaching, and it says that thousands came to know the Lord. And then we read immediately in uh, verse 42 the following. They, the new believers basically, devoted themselves to the apostles. Devoted th themselves to the apostles' teachings, I should say. So the first thing they did is immediately studying the Word of God and to follow, uh, to fellowship. So you have a study of the Word, and then you have fellowship among the believers themselves. Why? Because iron sharpens iron. All these believers, some will be more mature than the other. Being in this fellowship, we will learn from one another. We can lean on each other. It's a family. We are a family, and we have one Father. That's our Heavenly Father. And Jesus is our ultimate model that we are all trying to get to. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings and to their fellowship, to the breaking of bread, that's the communion, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miracles, miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Notice the model of the early church. They were always together. If you want to learn, if you want to be effective, if you want to mature, you cannot live among worldly sinners and expect to grow in maturity in Christ. That doesn't work. Yes, we are called to live among people in the world and reach out to them, but for the sake of sharing Christ with them. But how will I know how to share 
if I distant myself from my heavenly family. It's so disappointing sometimes that people distant themselves from believers, and sometimes for obvious reasons, they were burned by them maybe. They were used by them, which is an unfortunate thing. But that doesn't mean that we have to use the example of one or two bad apples to apply it basically to the entire body of Christ. We are still uh, commanded basically by Christ to love one another. That's one of his commands. And we have to be in fellowship with each other. How can I love them if I'm not in fellowship with them, if I distant myself from them? I mean, Jesus taught us not only to love each other, but to love our neighbors and to love our enemies. I mean, no matter how we look at it, we still commanded to care for each other. And this is basically the important thing for us, that we have this fellowship among the believers as a model for us to become a better disciple. Because I can lean on my brothers and sisters in Christ by learning things, asking them uh, about things, maturing with them, witnessing things, going through trials together. Prayer is important. You need a fellowship with believers and you need people to pray for you. One of the most effective ways that I have discovered myself in my own ministry is having people praying for me. There are people right now at this minute while I'm sharing with you who are gathered to pray for me and to pray for the words that will come out of my mouth, to pray for this show, to pray for this episode, to pray for the people behind the scene that are helping me work through this. Why? Because it is important. But if I didn't have that fellowship with others, other mature believers, I wouldn't be able to sit down here and tell you that people are praying for me and praying for you as well. So it is very important that we look at this particular model of the early church. Another important thing that the early church went through is persecution. That by itself is another step that believers go through. Believe it or not, going through trials can help mature uh, your walk. You will not be able to become stronger in your walk unless you go through trials and yes, there are degrees of trials that people will go through. Some of us might have mild persecutions. Some of us may not face persecution at all, and others will face severe persecution. I'll speak for myself. I immediately, after coming to Christ, faced immediate persecution from my own immediate family. I was abandoned by them. I lost a marriage as a result of this. I lost a job as a result of this. I was severely threatened by my own community. All of that was for the sake of sharing Christ and accepting him as well as Lord and Savior. If it wasn't for the body of believers around me to strengthen me, to disciple me, to pray with me, to help me grow and mature, I probably won't be sitting here today sharing this with you or even teaching you. I am not teaching because I am a person who has a graduate degree, not at all. I teach because the Word of God helped me grow and mature and enlighten me, but because of the faithfulness of other believers who also encouraged me and prayed for me to get to this point. So this is something that I truly encourage you, and I tell you this, many people sometimes ask me, well, I don't know how you knew about the doctrine of the Trinity and why were you able to explain it. I wish I can do the same. My answer is this, I did not explain a doctrine because of my own intellectual ability. I explained the doctrine because of the Word of God. It is in the Word of God, every one of us have that access and have the right to read it and be able to ask questions and understand it and explain it to others. And that's exactly what Paul asked Timothy to do, to learn, to mature, to teach others, and others will teach others, and that's how the cycle will continue. Now, I can tell you that discipleship is a big word. It's a very popular word. It's used sometimes with ambiguity and vaguely, unfortunately, by the church, uh, used loosely, and sometimes people don't even understand what it means 
we just assume what it means. We assume it's a fellowship, maybe. We assume it's accountability. We assume it's evangelism or evangelistic activities, making converts. It's attending a Bible study. But it's a much, much, much bigger word than this. The discipleship at the church level is not attending seminars, by the way, is not listening to sermons. It's not even hanging out with older believers, believe it or not. It is about the Word, the Word of God, relationship with Christ first and with believers, and it's about serving Christ in ministry. That's what makes, uh, that's the steps or the characteristics that makes disciples. For instance, the Word is obeying the Word of Christ, learning the Word of Christ, and applying the Word of Christ. Luke 11, 28 teaches this. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all Scripture is God-breathed, and it's profitable for a number of things. Some of it is training, equipping, rebuking, but it's the Word of God that is the source of all of this. Relationship and building a relationship that features love, commitment, authenticity, accountability, and intentionality is very important. Matthew 9.9 9 teaches this, for instance. In uh, John 11:54, we learn this. In 1 Thessalonians 2:8, Paul says that you have become so desirous to us that we've decided to share with you not only the gospel of God or the word of God, but also our lives because you have become so dear to us. Notice how important it was for him to learn the word, share the word, and serve those that he is ministering to. And finally, ministry is important because it involves training the disciples in service and evangelism according to the Word of God by modeling ourselves before them. It is the humbleness and humility that we show others what makes us disciples of Jesus. One of the greatest things I encountered is when I meet people who are extremely wealthy but yet so humble to the point that you cannot even tell that they are wealthy people. Why? Because their heart is in the right place. They worship the Lord. They do not worship material. I ask of you right now, if you are a follower of Jesus, to make it a mission for you to continue to grow in the Word of God, to continue to mature, to continue to have that fellowship with the believers and minister and serve the Lord through the lives of others, believers and non-believers. And if you are a seeker, I pray that you will find comfort in Jesus Christ and grow in Him. Until we meet again, have yourself a blessed day.